button. Welcome to the um, Diversity and Inclusion Working Group for May, May the 4th be with you. Could you start um, live transcripts? I, yeah, I was trying to find that button while I was talking, which is why I stumbled over myself. So, <laughs> I was thinking this is going to be a great meeting. Never, never attempt know where to, you are. <laughs> never attempt to multitask if you're trying to find the Zoom button as one of the tasks. Um, so we'll, I'll ask for volunteers for a facilitator next week. This is my second week in a row, so it'd be good to uh, spread around a little bit. Um, so it looks like Elizabeth, Ruth, and Matt have an update for She Code Africa newcomer bot. Yeah, um, we just saw a demo and it's awesome. It's really great. So, um, and I think it's gonna, um, this is gonna lay a really good foundation for us to build on in the future. Um, this project is uh, kind of short. So um, it's, you know, almost to the point May 6th, any, any time from May 16th to May 30th, they can wrap it up. So it's, you know, it's a pretty short project. Um, but this is going to be an excellent start. And um, can you show us quite, anything? I was going to say, it's not quite ready to okay. go outside of our small group because there's some tweaks that they want to make. But um, yeah, I'm really, really proud of the work that Precious A and Midi have done. Um, just really outstanding. And Ruth and Matt have been fantastic in kind of helping them along. Matt in particular has helped them tremendously with, um, you know, just the technical side of things. Um, also, I wasn't sure we, we did set up a, um, yeah, Matt C, sorry, Matt C. Uh, we clear, did yeah. set up a, um, a chaos Heroku free account. So I don't know where to drop that information, but um, they found that really useful when they were creating their bots. So um, we have that if anybody wants to use it, anybody wants to use it, but I don't know where to, to that's put a, it. That's a cloud-based computing infrastructure similar to Amazon's, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, so that's available if anybody wants it. I'm gonna, so, is the so, question about like what to do with the credentials or just? Well, that and also just to kind of let people know that that's a thing that we have if they want to use it. So, they can. I use Amazon. Um, I can't remember the name of the service, but I mean, I'd be interested in looking at what it is. Yeah, um, I can add you as a. Actually, I'll add you and Matt G as just an owner of the account, um, and I have the credentials in LastPass uh, that we share. So I'm actually making an administrator folder right now, and we need to yeah, manage this. Yeah. <laughs> Are you putting that on the Google Drive? I'll share it with you and Sean and maybe Georg, just a few people, maybe the board or something like that. We just need like like an infrastructure for knowing a document these that's maybe I think the board might be a good set of owners to have. Yeah, more you, than a small group. Yeah. Are you putting that in the Google Drive, the Chaos Google Drive? Um, no, I, I can though. Maybe actually, why don't you just go ahead and do that? Okay. You just make like an admin folder. Okay, let me just drop a uh, an action item for me. I know that's not really DEI, but just talking, listening to you talk about the Heroku stuff. Yeah, because we started one. Um, there is a, a folder where we were dropping things like for DEI badging and things like that. So it's private in the Google Drive. Yeah. But we thought like we were talking about this with Kevin actually yesterday too. Um, we can put some of those docs out like on GitHub and on the website and wherever else and then link to those private docs so that everybody knows where they are, just not everybody can see them. That's a great idea. Yep. Okay. Um, add this to internal docs. Okay. Cool. Hi, Precious. Um, yeah, so that was pretty much it. But um, here's the timeline too. I, I added that in there in case anybody's curious of when that project wraps up, but it does wrap up pretty soon. So um, hopefully very soon we'll have um, the ability to for somebody else to kind of check that out. And also um, we're thinking we will when we when we deploy it, it'll 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 go to everybody that's on our Slack, which is a lot of people, but like we want it to eventually be able to, you know, anybody, it, it does not just newcomers, but anybody can like message the bot and get information that they want. We, we were, um, Ruth can attest, we were talking about in thinking of the, the conversation we had at the community meeting yesterday about the different kind of roles people have here, if they're new 
um, looking for information on metrics specifically, or if they're even, you know, a core contributor, or if they're, you know, somewhere in the middle, um, then we like the paths that they take on the website might also kind of mirror what this bot could do for people. So if you want to see, hey, what are the meetings this week? Like that bot could just tell you like things like that, you know, where a quick information, it could tell anybody. So we, when we deploy it, it will go to everyone with a message that says, hey, here I am. Um, I'm here for you. So just a heads up that that's going to happen. Because that's going to go to a lot of people, but, but it's then it's available to everybody. So. So then would you, I'm thinking that, I mean, that seems totally fine. And then maybe in the description of the channels, like you put how to query the bot. How are you, is that what you're planning on doing? Yeah, something like, um, like Ruth had the idea of just doing like an FAQ, like just type FAQ and then it's got you some main okay. thing. You can then, you know, kind of go down the tree. Okay. So, yeah, so that's exciting. Jerry. I also put number two on the agenda. So okay, yeah, go right ahead. And continue talking. <laughs> yeah, keep, <laughs> keep, on, keep on trucking. <laughs> um, okay, so if you're not following the, <laughs> the event badging repo, um, then your email inbox is probably a lot less busy than those who have been watching it because we've gotten a ton, ton, ton of applications recently, um, mostly from uh, one or two people at the LF. Um, so that a lot of these events are similar in structure and the way that they're thinking about DEI. Um, that being said, it's still a lot of applications, like we're talking maybe 15 at once. Um, so uh, we are looking for more badger, badgers, badge reviewers. Um, we are going to- Badgers. Gonna, badgers. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's what we should call them. Oh, <laughs> I, think I, have a little, oh, I just got that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I just got a great idea. Okay. I, I can see the idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know where I'm going with it. You have little yeah. badger t-shirts. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly yes. what I was going to say. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. Maybe even a little plushy. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but they, th they have been doing an amazing job. Um, Kafaya. Oh my gosh. Kafaya is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kafaya has been the one that's assigning everybody and keeping it all straight. Um, so Awesome, awesome, awesome job to you, Kafaya. Thank you so, well much. Done. so much for that, Kafaya. Like just yeah. kind of keeping everybody on track <laughs> right? because there's a lot to keep on track. There is, there is. Um, so, um, so yeah, so great job to her and to all the event badge reviewers. But we are looking for more to kind of ease the burden. Um, if if history repeats itself, we will have another wave in the fall. Um, and they usually come all at once. So in, within a couple of days. So it would be great to have just a, a larger pool at that time. Um, and it does take some kind of onboarding. So that being said, I think I'm going to host this um, session here on May 18th, um, just in case anybody is interested and we'll kind of, you know, spread the word on that. Um, but I think that that will just be like an open Q and A. Here's what, how it works. Here's what you would need to do as a, as a reviewer. I think it's, it's, a really good way for someone to join the chaos community. It's pretty like straightforward and it's, it's pretty low. Um, usually, <laughs> usually it's low, uh, low ask of time. So um, yeah, there's that. Could you push that out the meeting like to Twitter and all that kind of stuff? I will. Yeah. I, I literally just scheduled that like okay. half yeah. an hour ago. I, I, said, I just went to look and it's on my calendar already. Yeah, I was like, I think I'm going to do this. I put something in the badging channels, like, hey, do you guys think this would be a good idea? Okay. And then I'm like, I'm going to just do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, don't just do it. Yeah. Wait. And I didn't yeah, wait. Keep it in mind because most of them are the Linux Foundation, they have it down to a science. They do. And everything is cookie cutter. So while you still do need to look at them and make sure you can find everything, especially if it's Wendy putting it in, she knows exactly how to answer all the questions. You just glance at it, you, you verify and boom, you're done. Um, now we do have some new ones that came in like um, the one I had sent over from Open Info Summit. And there are differences. And, and you know, some people would think we were unhappy with our result. And yet we were like thrilled because, you know, childcare is something that we know we don't have and we can't have, and we're good with that. 
So don't think that everyone needs to be that gold because most of these organizers do know where they're lacking and they have reasons for why they're lacking. I mean, the only thing that we could have sense. argued with better was the travel support program, while it doesn't say it's for diversity as a constant previous um, recipient of it, they do take diversity into account. It's just not written there. Um, so little things like that, yeah, we can change for the future. But you know what, even if that going forward, we're gonna be silver all the time because of the childcare issue, we're good with that and we're proud of what we do. So don't think everyone has to be gold is my main point. That's a really good point. Like, yeah, there are conferences legally we just can't provide childcare at. Yeah, for sure. And um, there is, it is on in the works of us adding even more criteria, again, with the accessibility, that's gonna be a separate section. So um, as soon as we get through this wave, um, we'll be releasing version 4.0. And so it's gonna be even trickier to get a gold bash. So yeah, absolutely. Silver is, is wonderful as well. So yeah. And I guarantee Linux Foundation gets it down to a science and they will always be golden and that's okay. There yeah. is nothing we'll wrong with that. that. Yeah, we'll just keep pushing it. It's good. <laughs> I would agree on the LF applications. I mean, they're so consistent in what they do in it, particularly like if it's uh, Kubernetes, they have all the ancillary events. Like a lot of that information is repeated across those ancillary events. Mm -hmm. So like the, for it's example, the code of conduct. If you get it right once, you just cut cookie cutter it all. Yeah. Right? And that's fine. And they only post like their, um, I think maybe even the application for the diversity access tickets. It's kind of one path for all ancillary events or the code, codes of conduct. It's a single code of conduct that is and kind I of shared across. Travel support them. being one that they've only got so much money between all the programs. Yeah. So I found it great. I mean, I, I love the consistency. That's good. Um, should we do talk about code of conduct? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I so the idea from last week was that we would spend maybe all of us spend like maybe five minutes on our current code of conduct or 10 minutes. And the the ask is that we take a look at this code of conduct just from a from a code of conduct perspective, but also to make sure that uh, it is it feels like it's applicable to all parts of, of what we do in the chaos project. So that would be like meetings like this, it would be conversations in Slack, it would be uh, at our chaos con events. So we just have a single code of conduct that we feel is applicable to all all activities that we do within the chaos project. So it's really just reading it to help ensure that. And right. if, it's, if it's not, then adding some text that helps. And from last time, I think we had some recognized potential inconsistencies or things we wanted to address in these three sections. So I'll just uh, bring that commentary from last time forward for us. So if we could all just take five or 10 minutes. Should I pause the recording for this? Yeah, we always do that. And then we have really good conversations. All right, I'm just gonna let it run then.
does this code of conduct enforce the positive both lists in the standards what do you mean uh so if if uh so the in the standards is broken down into two sections uh about creating a positive environment and then also unacceptable behavior uh, so obviously the unacceptable behavior is could lead to some enforcement uh, but what does enforcement look like on that above list, right? So are you, are you in violation of the code of conduct if you uh, don't use welcoming and inclusive language or don't show empathy towards other community members? So like mapping it back to those exact points? Yeah. yeah is, it, is it mapped in the same way? Because they're kind of, they're kind of presented both as a list of like this is what we want to do uh and I, I i don't think it's supposed to both be mapped to enforcement uh, but as a code of conduct document it, it does it, it kind of feels that way now like the like that that above list would be mapped to some sort of enforcement too you want to propose a change that helps clarify that uh, maybe we maybe you move that the examples of behavior that contribute to a positive environment. Maybe you move that up to the R pledge section, uh, and then the the R standards uh, section can outline the unacceptable behavior. Okay. Do you want me to move it? Uh, does anyone else want to? discuss it or I mean I, I guess I hadn't really seen the mapping between them the points you're just talking about like the five points that are under positive environment Those aren't mapped anywhere, is that correct in your mind? The if we so the so so in theory with the code of conduct, if 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 our standards aren't followed, then enforcement is going to occur. Correct? Um well if the standards aren't followed, we have a process. Okay, so um, so I so I, I think we need to I be believe. clear about what those standards are, <clears throat> and and how they're connected to enforcement. So there, these the the two lists here. One of them is this is behavior that we we would we would really love to foster in our community, and this is this is really good stuff. And then the second list is a list of things that could trigger code of conduct enforcement and stuff that we we really want to prevent. I think it says it in enforcement. Um, instances of abusive, harassing, or otherwise unacceptable behavior may be reported. So I don't know that we would need necessarily need to report the absence of, uh, like if someone joins the community and nobody happens to say, hey, welcome to chaos. Like that's in my mind, not a breach of the code of conduct. It would be great if we could do that every time, but yeah, I, I agree. I think I think the one list is about kind of fostering a positive environment, and the other one is kind of this this list of things that we want to prevent and could trigger enforcement in the code of conduct. I th and I think we kind of need to separate them in the in the language of the document. Is does that make sense? Yes. Um, I will also just mention that we, we did take this pretty much not exactly word for word, but pretty close to the contributor covenant code of conduct. So like, I think it's not, I think it would be, in my opinion, it would be okay to leave, leave it also as it is. Um, Cause I think that's kind of tried and tried and true, tried and true. Um, established. Established. That's a much better word. Um, but I do understand your, I do understand what you're saying, Kevin. I'm not sure how to. So the, the, the problem with code of conduct enforcement is that most 
like most projects aren't very good at enforcing it. And oftentimes they're not very good at enforcing code of conduct because they're not really sure what they should be enforcing. Uh, so I think if we're, if we, if we're talking about enforcement, uh, we probably need to create clear actionable things that, that, that would occur. Uh, so, so right now the enforcement is, is, it's pretty vague, right? It's, I'm not really sure what would happen if I were to, uh, from reading this, I'm not really sure what would happen if I were to use abusive language, for example. I well, I think part of that vagueness is deliberate so that reason and sort of um, community standards can evolve through the, you know, if cases are brought to us, that probably means that there's something that we let pass in our culture that needs to be addressed. And so I think the reporting process is intended to be deliberative. Okay, so I think that I, that's, makes... That's my perspective. I could be wrong. That that may be that may be true, uh, but I think that makes enforcement difficult, and it also adds uh, uh, it removes transparency from from the process as well. Right. Okay, so, so we do have a statement that says if there is unacceptable behavior, you do report it. So that's what really triggers this. Yeah. All right. So then second point though is that what happens next like where are, what are the levels of egregious behavior and like what would be the what would be the outcome for that behavior and i think i think what he's saying is we should maybe be a little more explicit of of saying like here are kind of the levels that we have and here's what happens if you if your behavior reaches those levels is that fair kevin uh yes yeah so the yeah. having worked at universities for a while I'll say one of the one of the challenges with being more explicit is that it then sort of constrains us from enforcing new forms of harassment and bad behavior that arise that we haven't yet specified. So if you we have if we're going to be explicit, we have to be explicit about everything in order to be both fair and um, actually apply a community standard, I think, based, but again, I have my experience. I, I don't know if anyone here has been involved in this kind of enforcement work. Well, that's source. why I kind of like switching it to be or are encouraged to, mm -hmm. um, because even if they're not quite sure of the rules, you're at least encouraging them to speak up about something. They may not be right about it because, you know, they're not fully aware, but they are more likely to do some comment, you know, do something. If they're encouraged to, then it's your right and responsibility. Right. That's yeah, a lot that's, of pressure. Yeah, that's, I, I, yeah, I, think, I like your rewording there, Amy. Contributor Covenant um, does have levels. So in, in it, like here, I'll drop the link here, but it talks about mm -hmm. like, here are the enforcement guidelines and it's it's pretty clear on like here's what the community impact is here's what the consequence will be so like the it, and it goes through the levels so like the first one is a correction the next one is a warning here's what's here's what you did to get a warning and here's what the warning is and then here's what it would take <coughs> to get a temporary ban from our community and here's a permanent ban like so i think that that's pretty clear of like kind of showing like, oh, okay, what if I do this thing, what's gonna happen to me? I guess that took me to a markdown document. You can view it in Chrome. Yeah. Tragically, I'm not using Chrome. can drop those sections in this doc so y'all can see them if that's easier. No, I think it's probably, I'm probably in them using Firefox. No, I think those are good. I, I do hesitate just a little bit with mapping anything to a thing. I mean, as we just talked with mm -hmm. folks about 
code of conduct and code of conduct enforcement, it is very much an it depends oftentimes. So I, so what I'm seeing in this enforcement guideline, it doesn't really say if you do this, then you get that. It says these are the parameters of enforcement that the, the group would do. Well, it does say if you use inappropriate language or use behavior yeah. deep unprofessional, here's your consequence. That's I feel yeah. like though that the uh, the more transparent we are with the the expectations, then the easier it is to enforce um, because it kind of takes away the fuzzy. It takes away yeah. the ambiguity for the enforcement team because whoever's looking at this, like you agreed that you read this and you saw that if you use this kind of language, this is my probably what's going to happen if someone reports it. So like. It, it it maybe clarifies the the shared uh, like the shared construct that we're all understanding instead of this like more fuzzy kind of like black box mystery of what's going to happen i don't know i do think the community impacts are ambiguously enough stated they're ambigu they're ambiguous enough that they they can be applied without restricting like if somebody comes up with a new way of harassment I still think we can classify it into one of these four categories. Well, then let's just take this and put it in there. Yeah, I agree. I'm copying and pasting from it. I mean, in a way, go below I have... contact or below enforcement. Is it below the contact? for now and somebody else can feel to feel free to move that around as you will Yeah, I think that resolves my issue. <clears throat> Thank you. Now the document is much longer. Matt, would you, uh, would it make sense to have Joanna, like just kind of look at this and give some feedback on it? Do you think she'd be willing to do that? Maybe she's been so, I hate to keep asking. Right, right, right. Or maybe we just like generally send her a quick question of like, hey, how do you feel about the, explicitly being, you know, or being explicit about these kind of levels? Right. <clears throat> And the fact that the levels come out of a standard document is helpful. And I do think they've done a nice job of phrasing the community impact part.
could also run this past the DEI audit team and get their input as well. Because I know that Justin has done yeah, a lot. Yeah, let's start there. I like that. A lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. So this is significantly advanced. Hang on. Two. I think this is something that would require board approval then too, because it's one of our main community documents. Yep. Yeah, totally. It's like Google Doc heard you say board approval and just autofilled it. What? I'm, I was updating the notes, um, and so I said next steps after today's edit run by the DEI audit team, refine and adjust no, based on somebody, I'm, Hopefully somebody typed that. I typed seek board and then it suggested approval. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Google's getting pretty good guessing. Creepy good, I guess. Creepy, yeah. So we've probably been at this for about 10 minutes, which is what, which is what we allocated. Do we want to continue editing this? Yeah, I think okay. I'm, I'm pretty happy. To, <coughs> uh, that was not yes to continue editing. I'm pretty happy with at least the scope. I changed that just a little bit to make sure that it represents events, like all places, basically. There were a few kind of ambiguous statements that we had in there, like for more information. <laughs> Yeah. Here. I don't She's know. I think it's reaching into the ether. Yeah. Um, so I think this is good. Okay. Awesome. All right. And we've got some next steps. And I'm going to by the DEI audit team and then we'll make any adjustments based on that feedback and seek board approval. Next item is event badging updates. And I oh, think we talked a little bit about this that. earlier. Yeah, yeah. So many events. Got it. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and project badging, I think, is a larger topic. Uh, it is. I mean, I think this came up a couple of weeks ago, and I'm glad Katie's on because these are some really nice ideas from Katie. I, I'd like to, to, to kind of start moving forward with this. And so mm -hmm. we had talked about what this, what project badging could look like. And we understand the limitations of so many projects, so few reviewers, and we have to accept that challenge. Um, and so one of the things that had come up in that last meeting was maybe even just chaos passing. Like maybe we could take a look at this from like get, get the first level done first and then think about the second level second and then maybe the third level third. I think with event badging, we just kind of went all in where every badge was possible through the process. So you mm -hmm. could get a gold, a silver, you know what I mean? They were all available right at the, right at the beginning. And I was thinking <coughs> that maybe with, with um, project badging, we don't make all levels available to start. We only make passing available to begin, like whatever passing would be. That would be like taking a small plate to the buffet. So we can just kind of get a sense of what our appetite for the work is. Yeah, and we don't try to even pretend that we could give a chaos amazing badge yeah. for a project to start. It's just too the that distance is just too far from where we're at at the moment. And so I think this might have to be scaled up a little bit differently than event badging. That's my thought. And so one of the thoughts was that came up a couple of weeks ago that chaos passing could be really just kind of confirming that there is a, a code of conduct, kind of like what we just did, you know, a, a description of this, we could follow whatever it might be like scope, um, enforcement, you know, reporting, you know, the particular components of a code of conduct, and that's clearly identified within a project. And then some sort of, we had talked about like a DEI.MD file, do you remember this? Where we had, we have um, project, uh, metrics, and it would be a document within a project's um, organization or within, you know, maybe their community repo 
that is basically in it, it attests to attention to metrics. So you know how like in event badging, we say things like um, demographics, speaker and attendee demographics, and like how it's used. And really the the answer to that usually doesn't come from the website. It comes from a response that, for example, Wendy gives in the application and we read her response. You know what I'm talking about? And so my thought was is that the DEI.md file could be some sort of attesting attestation or attesting to attention to a metric. So if I was to pull up, say, the project metrics, the project DEI metrics. Um, some of them are like one could be like board council diversity. And so this the metric would be board council diversity, but within this DEI go to the yeah you can oh, scroll yeah. down yeah no 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 you were in the right spot was i yeah yeah God. metrics okay and just go down to like the dei metrics there we go and so the top is what we're largely using for events mm -hmm. obviously and then we have these other released metrics around projects and so like if, if we say issue label inclusivity for example it's you're just go it's just right there so it wouldn't be that we as part of the review would go determine whether or not they are providing um good issue labels to promote inclusivity we would really just be looking for a statement that says how they are addressing issue label inclusivity does that make sense and we would just read the statement <clears throat> and the statement's really not for us it's for the members of the project so if you go yeah. okay i was going to make some notes about it but yeah I'll go back yeah um board council diversity like it's not we wouldn't necessarily go check it as part of the review we would just look at this dei.markdown file and see what statement they're providing to their community members <laughs> to be conscious and aware of board council diversity and something that they work on in the project see what i'm saying so like does this make sense? So we're just really looking for yeah. two documents. One would be a code of conduct mm -hmm. and one would be a DEI.md file and whatever metrics that we ask for them to talk about in the DEI.md file is to be determined still. What do people think about that? Well, I like the example of issue inclusivity. I want to make a note of it while the others talk. But even not down to the metric level, what do people think about kind of this structure? That if we're a project and we're going to ask for a chaos DEI project badge, here are the two things we have to do. We have to make sure we have a code of conduct fully accessible to everybody. And we have to make sure we have a DEI.md file in our community repo. <laughs> and the DEI.md file has a couple things in it. It has like how we commit to attend to maybe three or four metrics. What about projects that aren't hosted on GitHub or GitLab? Don't know yet. <laughs> they could still have a DEI.md in, I guess, like Garrett, for example. I don't know that it has a organization level in the same way that platforms do. So perhaps it would be in whatever this, I don't know if there's a standard way that you would express that kind of project level thing, for example, in automotive, automotive grade Linux, where it is uh, a project and I see Ruth has her hand up and Katie had a comment too okay yeah but let's comment so one thing I see here is projects coming in to apply for a badge and ending up going back to create like that file because I, I, I think it's not like a usual thing that projects have so I, I don't know how you are correct they would have to go back and create the file Right. So a couple of things. Um, one, something I learned actually this last week at um, con a convention about when on documentation was if you're 
if we do this, if we put at the top of it, of the application, like you will need these, before you apply for this, you will need these two things. So they only have to leave once and then they come back and they finish the whole thing. So they don't start and stop in the middle of a document. Right. And then, and that will get more users to come back and not just put it a tab on their bar and forget about it for four weeks. Um, the other thing was, if we have a template document, is that we, I know we discussed that a couple weeks ago. We would. We, it would be I, a template, okay. Yeah, so I think we would have like a DEI.MD template that they could just use. And I know we had talked about for the submission process, having it within a three month period and it being like a two year, get it for two years or something if you yep. have it in a three month submission period. Yep, just to kind of help year. us. Yeah, I think that's a good idea too. somewhere right before the holidays so that nobody is swamped over winter holidays. Yep. Yeah. I, I just made it, I used the term expiration date. I'm not sure that that's the most positive way to put it. I don't know. <laughs> Must reapply date. Ruth, did you have a question? Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I had to suggest <clears throat> one as well. So I think something we might want to do during the planning phase of this is put out the survey to learn how projects say they are, like how they put it out there that they are, you know, their project is diverse and inclusive. I want to learn how projects do that. Um, so when we, we might get some, you know, good information when we're trying to plan this as well. I like that, thank you. Elizabeth, do you have a comment? Do um, just something for us to, to consider is how we would uh, address questions from projects and like where would we send them? Like, would we have them just join the chaos community? Is there like a separate place for them to ask questions, like our, our discourse or mm -hmm. some other way? I just think we should put that somewhere on our radar of like, we need to have a clear place for them to engage with us for questions or, um, you know, feedback, whatever, um, so that it, so that the rest of the community doesn't quite get the noise. Because I could see that we would get, you know, maybe a lot, a lot of uh, engagement from people. So in order for people to submit an application, don't they already have to be a, like have joined the project in order to interact with it? They have to be for event on, badging. Yeah. For event badging, they just they interact through uh, GitHub issue. Okay. And we could do Elizabeth. Would that could that solve that problem? Is that is it that type of interaction you're looking for? Because I, I would imagine we would still have a checklist of things. I mean, it would look a lot like event badging. Yeah, I think that would be um, that would be the best place then if if it just goes through an issue. Okay, that was my thought that we would just yeah, kind of okay. do the same process. Okay. Like, a little bit, I think it would be a little bit lighter weight than the event badging one, but that was my thought. But they would still have to apply via uh, the way they apply now. There would still be a whole kickoff of this has come in, we need to assign reviewers. Okay. Yeah. Yep. That was my thought. Yeah, that makes sense. So if they had questions, they would just ask on their specific issue. I think so. Okay. Yeah. And that seems to you tell me would, if that's would not, project. Go ahead. A quick question: Would project badging go under badging or chaos? For an um, order, we'd probably put it under the badging. That's where event badging lives. Got it. Um, and then Elizabeth, I was going to say, like with respect to the DEI <laughs> event badging, even though the issues are kind of unique and siloed per each particular event. Um, has that been okay in terms of like being able to communicate recurring questions? You know, like I'd hate to have it always in a like these little paths and somebody has the same question, we keep answering it over and over and over again. Yeah, that would that would be we'd have to have like maybe a landing page within like an FAQ and things. And maybe we could because I think we're planning on having a an event badging 
channel somewhere in the discourse in the cast discourse so maybe we could have okay. something similar in case there are you know larger discussions that need to be made okay or like and then we could answer once and yeah yeah, yeah. i just because the number of projects obviously is like way more than the number of event organizers so i, I just agree. want to be mindful of that influx yeah. so, yeah. i mean that i think that's a good point that with discourse, everyone can be participating in the same thread and read the same thread. If we have people open issues, then they have their, we probably are repeating a lot of information in those issue comments. Okay, this is really helpful. Um, I'll kind of think about this for next week based on this list and think about maybe what the next best next steps could be without just overwhelming everybody as well. You know, so it's not, I don't think the goal is to implement this <laughs> within the next month or anything. No. Uh, <laughs> Faster is worse, I think, in this case. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that um, actually kind of brings us to time. Um, so uh, I think we got through all the items. Is there anything else that folks want to add before we? tidy up and end this discussion, this wonderful meeting that we've had. All good. Okay. Well, as facilitator, then I'll say thank you all for contributing and participating and being here. And we will see you in a week if you can join us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good day.